It's the How Games Make Money podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Grubb from GamesBeat.com. This is the show where I talk to people working in and around games and ask them, how does this business work? New episodes come out each Friday. On this episode, I'm talking to Jeffrey Thompson Jr., who is one of the founders of Epoch Media. Epoch is a gaming startup that is currently part of the Reactor X Accelerator program in Poland, and it is Jeff's goal to become the first black American to get venture capitalist funding in that country. We also talk about the racial biases he faces and whether we should have strong alternatives to the VC funding system. But first, thank you for listening. You can get more from me at gamesbeat.com. Email me about the podcast at jeff.grub at gmail.com with the subject line, How Games Make Money. Or reach out on Twitter. I'm at Jeff Grubb. The podcast is at HGMM Show. Okay, let's get to the episode. All right, let's get right into it. Joining me now is Jeffrey Thompson Jr. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, I'm Jeff Thompson Jr. As you said, I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I've lived in over seven countries. Right now, I'm based in Warsaw, Poland. Um, I have the startup called Epoch Media. It's a game studio startup. After working, you know, f- for years in the industry, wanted to sort of branch off on my own, do my own thing. I felt like that's very important, and the time couldn't be better due to obviously recent events going on in the world. Um, the motto is: We want to make great, compelling. Great video games with compelling narrative stories to them. Uh, I have great co-founders with uh, Jakub and Roger Gonzalez. Um, we're, we're developing a third-person stealth action game and also a prequel graphic novel coming up with it. Um, right now, we're participating in a pre-accelerator program called Reactor X. And it's based in Warsaw, Poland, and it's going great. You are in an accelerator program in Poland how did you end up there? What was that process like? Oh, uh, wow. Um, the, one of the co-founders of the program, uh, Boris, I can't even pronounce his last name correctly. <laughs> Polish, obviously. Uh, I reached out to Boris, I believe, on Twitter and, you know, sent them some game pitch information. And we just started talking. And he also runs Smock VC. And he, you know, suggested that I apply to uh, Reactor X. And that's when I first found out about it. And from that process on, I had an interview with Agata and Dorota at Reactor X. And from that point on, you know, I interviewed and then they announced that I, you know, my startup was one of the lucky few that got selected. And we went from there. And, and, so, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like it was something that you just kind of made happen through force of will. Is is that how you feel about it? Do you feel like, oh, you, you lucked out or, 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 yeah, yeah. How do you feel about that? Um, well, I, I like to divine intervention, I guess, something that's, you know, very cliche. I think it, it was it was a definitely an important step uh, in that process because it's a great program. Um, they really, you know, support entrepreneurs. Uh, every week we have workshops. Over the course of 10 weeks, um, you're going to have workshops. They place you with a lead mentor. The lead mentor gets a little bit of equity in your startup. And the lead mentor is someone who um, was, you know, fairly successful in the field that you're in. So naturally they they advise you on, you know, a lot of topics. You ask a lot of questions. With me, I ask I ask Boris and Agata a lot of specific questions. I'll probably bug them to death, but you know, I love them and uh <laughs> you know, you always have to be a sponge, you know, always have to be a student and learn as much as you can, right? And be humbled. So do you feel like you are learning a lot? Do you feel like this is um th- that you are getting that that useful mentoring that you need? Yes, yes. My mentor is Pavel Kopinski. Uh, he was the former head of marketing at Techland. Techland is one of the largest, yeah, I believe, the second largest studio game studio in Poland behind CD Projekt Red. But yeah, he's been right. phenomenal, man. The guy's been phenomenal. Great guy. Uh, we just we click. Um, you know, I pick his brain on different topics. You know, and he's there when I need him. We have calls, and I just ask him tons of questions in this. You know, not only on the business side, but the development side, right? Um, and with Reactor X, I'm learning so much about the the European ecosystem out here because obviously that's mm-hmm. not it's not. Um, I wasn't very knowledgeable in it, right? Because obviously being American, I focus a little bit more on the American side of things. But learning in particular the great ecosystem, the great up and coming ecosystem in Poland in particular, and how. You know, the people of Reactor X, they're on the right track. They're doing the right things, right? 
and also a name that I forgot to mention is Diana. She's been very helpful, you know, in our conversations that we've had, you know, they, they just positive people in general. Um, because before this, I would, you know, say that my opinions were a little bit on the negative side. And then when I met the people at Reactor X, all that changed. What are some of the lessons that you're taking away? Like, do you see opportunities for your development studio uh, in, in Europe? Yes, I do. I really do. Um, well, one of the one of the cons is that they're not used to associating with people that look like me, right? Um, I like to say that in Europe, in particular, it's a different type of classism slash racism. So mm-hmm. they're not used to people that look like me. Whereas in America, they're used to people that look like me, but they tend to carry a negative uh, connotation with it, right? Right. They're used. They're used to their their biases that they already have against you, and, and right. maybe in Europe they're learning their biases. The, well, I mean, I like to tell people. People tend to forget racism was invented in Europe, not America, because Europe is a lot older than America, right? So <laughs> I tell people that all the time. Just you know, calm down. You know, this is actually where it was mm-hmm. invented at, right? But we yep. just happen to accelerate the process a little bit faster in America. But the ecosystem is young, right? It's not as developed naturally so as in America. But I think the opportunity is ripe because it is so young, right? So it has the opportunity to grow and expand. And with an accelerate, with a pre-accelerate program like Reactor X, they're looking to actually become the next Y Combinator and discover, you know, uh, you know, a unicorn, right? Is the term that's used in the startup world. Discover the next unicorn, right? So I'm hoping that, you know, I truly believe that uh, they made the right decision. I know that they made the right decision by selecting my startup. And um, I'm hoping to actually be the first black entrepreneur in the history to get VC funding in Poland. I believe that's going to happen. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so, yeah, let's let's talk about that a little bit. I, I mean, you're, there's a million different topics here that I find super interesting, but let's like talk about the money side of things. So you go and join this accelerator. How do you pay for things now? Do the, are they giving you money? Is it a little bit of money? Do, are you waiting for a big, you know, a big funding day? Like, tell me about that. Oh, well, when you, when you get into, in particular with your actor X, as of right now, um, when you're accepted in, you don't necessarily get money. Uh, they do get some equity in your company, but it's for serious entrepreneurs. It's just the process that they have right now. You know, who knows? It may change in the future. They may, you know, end up getting money or something like that to actually put into the companies that get selected. But you, the introductions that you get, the the type of people, um, not only do you get a mentor, but you get three ad hoc mentors that you get to talk to and associate with. And I've been blessed and fortunate enough to uh, meet with those people, speak with them, pick their brains and bug them to death. And, you know, not only just talk about the business side of things, but just talk about life because at this stage, you know, when you're getting investment at the early stage, it's more or less about relationships and they're investing in you as a person um, more so than investing in your company. Right. Because, right. you know, I like to use the example of George Lucas. Alan Ladd didn't believe in Star Wars, but he believed in George Lucas and that's why he invested in him. How are you paying for things then uh, if there's not like a lot of money coming in yet? Is, is this just about like, are you living off savings or what? Bootstrapping, sweat equity, right? <laughs> you know, bootstrapping, sweat equity. Um, but you know, that's that passion and ambition is what is keeping me going because I truly believe in this with, my, with all my heart and soul and desire. I believe in this, and nobody's going to stop me. You know, um, I believe that you know greatness is 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 uh, you know the discipline. Having that discipline is going to lead to that greatness, right? Because every single day, you know, I wake up and and I do what I have to do in regards to pushing this a little bit forward, a little bit forward. You know, you are a a black man from St. Louis, Missouri in Poland. Do you feel like that, like you are bringing your culture into the things you create, correct? And you think that there, and you, and do you think that the, there is a, a thirst for that around the world in places like Poland? I believe so. Um, I, I do. I, I like to say that uh, because we're so influenced by what we see on TV or in this case on the Internet. Right. It, it affects us on a subconscious level. And what a lot of people don't know is that our subconscious is actually more powerful than our conscience. Right. So if we see these images. Right. If if you've been watching TV for so long and if every time you look on a TV, you've seen negative images of people that look like me. Right. You're going to that's going to shape your negative bias that you have. Right. So if I'm out, you know, what I, what I really want to do is to put 
uh, positive bias out there into the world. Not necessarily be preachy um, and have any political bias, but have some positive things, positive images, you know, of black males, et cetera, or, you know, just other people in general, but have interesting and intriguing stories to go along with it. So that's, you know, what I'm out to do. And I believe that, you know, I'm on, I'm on the right path for that. How is it? How does it feel living in a place that is predominantly white Europeans? Uh, not, not even predominantly. Like it seems like I think it, the number is like in the ninety percent. I'm oh, sure ninety nine point nine percent white. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You would you know better than me. Uh, what's what's that feel like? Like were there? I saw in a lot of European countries there were like Black Lives Matters pr- protests. Did, I mean, did yeah. you see anything like that in Poland? Yeah, there there actually were uh, in Warsaw and both in Poznan. But like I said, there's a. Um, you have, you have some people who, who are sort of ignorant out here. They're not necessarily, uh, informed on the, uh, history of the race relations issues within America. Like they don't know anything about Jim Crow. Hell, you got a lot of Americans who don't know anything about Jim Crow. They don't know anything about redlining and things like that. Right. There's a lot of arrogance out here. I had a guy recently, uh, when I posted about, you know, my black experience, he Polish guy, never lived in America a day in his life posted an article that he got from the internet and said that, you know, basically saying that he was right over based on my experience because of the article. And I'm like, that right there tells you your arrogance. And you have some people like that who, who think that they know everything and they're, they're not humbled enough to be corrected and admit when they're corrected. Right. So that's, you know, just little bit differences here and there in culture because, you know, they had communism out here and we didn't necessarily have that. And you know, to a lot of Americans who really don't know and understand, you know, they they people who preach, uh, you know, these pro communist uh, mantras, they really don't know what they're getting themselves into. You know, granted, America's not perfect, but uh, we do have some opportunities that a lot of other places don't have. Yeah, I'm, you know what? This is a, an interesting point to go down. You are. Uh, well into the like the VC system, which is you know I mean the capitalism is right in the word is like right in the phrase there. Um, and you know you called yourself an entrepreneur. You you want to be a, someone who starts their own business and succeeds and and you know pulls themselves up by their bootstraps and all that stuff. Do, do you want to do that because it's exciting? Do you feel like you're called to that? Do you feel like this is this is the uh, kind of opportunity that I want and, and deserve in life? Definitely, um, being an entrepreneur is is. is Granted, it's going to be a hard work, but there's a saying that I want to work 100 hours a week so that I don't have to work 40 hours a week. Right. So mm-hmm. being an entrepreneur is is not for the faint of heart, not for the weak minded. Right. There's going to be setbacks. There's going to be failures. But at the same time, you have to learn from those failures and you have to grow. Right. So it's an opportunity to always grow and, you know, always uh, be honest, be upfront, communicate with, you know, your investors, communicate with your team, um, you know, let them know. Hey, um, maybe this isn't going to work out. Can you help me out with this? Right. Um, recognize your strengths and rec- recognize your weaknesses. Right. The sooner you know that, the, the better off you'll be. And that's, you know, sort of the strategy that I'll take into this. I mean, but at the same time, like a country like Poland is like a very uh, still a very socialist country, still like a lot of uh, social support. Do you, do you feel like um, in a country like that? it is almost easier to be an entrepreneur than in a place like the United States, where if you, you know, quit your job, you might lose your health care or you might just not be able to eat or pay rent, uh, let alone, uh, which inherently makes it more difficult to be an entrepreneur. Do you feel that? Have you noticed that? Oh, um, not necessarily because there, there are, as far as, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, obviously, if you're not able to have, um, you know, rich family members, which is the case of the majority of black entrepreneurs, right? Um, you have to ask for outside funds and there's more outside funds, um, in America than there are in Poland. Like I said, it's a young system, it's a young ecosystem, right? So it's growing, but you know, something that I, I feel like that I have an advantage over a lot of other people is that the fact that I am American, I am, you know, of a different ilk, obviously you look at me, you see that I'm not Polish. Right. So I think that sort of gives me an advantage. And I think some VCs may say, hey, let's, you know, this guy is, you know, naturally looking at him. He has to think global, but he's in our country. So that's, you know, is from a marketing standpoint, it's a huge advantage, I, I feel, because, you know, English is my first language. So that's, you know, communicating English is, is you have to when you uh, want to have a global company. 
is, is this is this thing that you are involved with? Is it more about networking, more about learning? Is it about getting as much of both as possible? Uh, how would you describe that? Uh, it's about networking and learning for me because there was there were you know things that I didn't know as far as you know um, analyzing you know global markets and you know things of that nature that I really didn't know that I had to ask questions and I had to learn, right? Some things I did know and being in React Rex just confirmed what I already knew. So I, you know, it was like a breath of fresh air and also obviously networking with the, you know, and, and with the players out here, you know, meeting these different investors, um, meeting these, these different VCs. And, and also uh, when you're meeting these people, uh, understanding that understanding them from a cultural point of view right because obviously we have different cultures so that's you know something that always has has to be kept in mind when you're you know talking to people because the approach is is sort of a little bit different than when you're dealing with Americans per se I, I, and what are some of those things that you that you feel like you have learned that you are going to take with you oh wow <sighs> major question out of the hmm i'd say that uh um Having an ele- you know, a proper elevator pitch for my startup, <laughs> mm-hmm. a high concept pitch, having a proper marketing strategy, which is a little bit different in gaming than traditional uh, technology companies. Actually, you know, let's. I mean, like, I'm honestly, I, I'm completely ignorant about that kind of stuff. Like, uh, when you say. Um, have a, a proper marketing strategy for a video game. I, you know, I've re- I've written about games for almost ten years now. I, I've had a, a, a lot of these kind of com, com, a lot of these kinds of conversations now, and yet I still have no idea what that would mean. Like, does that mean just uh, having good social media presence? Like, what is it? What does a good marketing strategy look like for a game like yours? I think, well, for mine in particular, like you know, because each game is gonna is different, right? Um, I, for mine in particular, it, it, the marketing strategy for one. Um, we're going to approach uh, traditional uh, media outlets, right, to help build our game community. That's that's one thing that we're going to do, that we're planning to do. Uh, because I think right now, because of the times that we're living in, well, at least I know the times that we're living in, um, I feel like the video game industry is clamoring for uh, black video game developers. Um, and obviously, you, you, you look at the hashtag Black Game Dev on Twitter, and we participated in a, a picture game a Black Lives Matter event, and we got, you know, tons of retweets, tons of likes, tons of support. You know, people contacted me on Xbox, uh, sending me their emails, uh, you know, to have the game on their platform, et cetera, and other companies as well that I've met with, EA, Ubisoft, um, very positive meetings, private division, very positive meetings, and, and moving this thing forward. Um, the, the industry is clamoring for, and they want, you um, more black video game developers. They want content from black video game developers, uh, you know, to create great compelling games. And I feel like the time is now. Um, So with traditional video game marketing, that's going to be that, you know, like GameSpeed, right? Um, PC Gamer, some other, you know, major outlets. I feel like that they're, they they want it. And also non-traditional video game marketing outlets are interested in more black entrepreneurs like, you know, Power 105, right? Hot 97, complex they cover you know some video game stuff a variety the hollywood reporter right so and i have some you know relationships with a couple of those people so they they're all they're all looking for it right and now is the time and and you know i'm here and <laughs> and I'm, I'm you know ready to uh show the world what we what we have to do i, I mean are you getting the sense that like um a lot of people with money are realizing that uh black people spend a lot of money like black people have purchasing power i think a lot of uh companies are realizing that in america right now uh especially in the video game space they look at uh the success of and this of course is not just black americans but like nba 2k is a super super popular it's it's like one of the top three best-selling games in, the, in america every year uh and a lot of that has to do with with you know black americans like you know like these video games and they have money to spend and they're going to do that it's like they're a, a powerful cohort have you have you heard that sense from people with, with that are investing? Oh, uh, we haven't necessarily had that um, deep of conversation yet. But yes, we do have. Um, it is a known fact that we have purchasing power, and you know, there's more to it on that. Um, but I'm looking to sort of be a producer and not necessarily be a consumer, right? But with blacks having a lot of purchasing power, um, that goes without saying that having um, with the non traditional media marketing, right? Those outlets, those that cater towards a black audience, 
would definitely, you know, get behind me in this manner and support me. So that would definitely, you know, go into our marketing strategy as well, you know, because growing up, I didn't know any video game entrepreneurs that looked like me. I saw these video games. Right. And I, saw, I saw, you know, when I would see the little, the small number of black characters, you know, I was like, okay. And then I, you know, as I got older, I realized that these games were made by either, you know, white men or, or you know, in, in some rare instances, uh, Japanese people. And mm-hmm. I wanted to sort of change that. I want my nephew, my nephew's nine years old right now. And I want him to say, you know, my uncle made a video game, right? And and absolutely, you know, that he can relate to it, that he can play with for generations to come and, and show his children, right? And that's something that I want to, you know, show my children and, and sort of usher in a new uh, a new type of, you know, role model. I, I, in the future, I definitely want to be considered that I was the Jay-Z Kanye West of video games. That's that, That's it. You know, the Kobe Bryant of video games. That's what I want to be known as. When the most recent Black Lives Matters protests began to happen, uh, and I, I, you know, I don't know exactly where you were. I'm going to assume you probably were in Poland when this stuff started happening. Uh, again, the most recent ones. This, it's been happening for centuries now, but uh, the, uh, the most recent outburst against uh, police brutality and and the treatment of Black Americans overall uh, by systemic racism. Um, did you feel like, I guess, you know, just how were you feeling when this stuff started happening and, and you might've been uh, cut off from it in another, in another country? Well, for one, I was worried about my family and, and this was right. even before this happened because of the whole um, coronavirus situation, right? 2020, I think we all can agree. 2020 has been a very difficult year for us. Uh, but a mess. Yes, it it's a mess. It's been a, yeah, it's, but it, you know, in times like this, you know, I, I look at some of the positives and then I have to use it as a time to better myself and grow. Right. But in, in to answer your question, um, the Black Lives Matter, uh, the situation with George Floyd was very, very hurtful to see. It was it was it, 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 it was painful, you know, to see a man in handcuffs on the ground and with an officer who really didn't look like he cared for him when the man cried out over and over i can't breathe i can't breathe right that was very disturbing for me to see you know and and to see some people um because obviously you know america's divided with the right and the left the right sort of vilified him in death because they brought up his past well yeah he had a past okay but also bring up the officer's past bring up you know the 17 complaints that he had against him as well right so mm-hmm. if, if, don't don't play don't favor one side over the other right well yeah they bring up his past to de- dehumanize him and that's it they don't right. right right he's a human being and, and and his past says that his his past proves that he's a, a human being of worth and they, they never tried to do that right to almost justify his death well okay he had a past, right? But he hadn't committed a crime in over five years, right? So I believe that he was, you know, headed down the right path and wanted to. But even if he was, like, even if he was committing a crime, you can't kill the man you for it. Man, right, you can't. Madness. Right, yeah, you can't kill. Right, because when you're a police officer, you're sworn in to protect and serve. Yeah. So at that point, the officer that murdered him and the other officers, because it, it was later on found out that there were three officers kneeling on him at the same time. It wasn't just the officer that had his knee on his neck. So that was just, mm-hmm. I just didn't understand that at all. It was, it was disgusting. And, you know, those guys who did it, you know, they should never wear a badge ever again. That's just how I feel about it. Is is like uh, uh, movements like to fund the police? Is this something that you have uh, heard from throughout your life, or is this something that is relatively new to you? For me, for me, I probably heard it in different forms, in different mm-hmm. uh, aspects. But this particular slogan, this specific one, is relatively new for me. Right? Um, I'm interested to see what comes of this. If it, if it's you know, if people are just giving lip service because it sounds good and they're living in the moment or if they really mean it. Right. Because a lot of times, you know, right. come election year, politicians, they're always going to give lip service to say the right things to get your votes. And then when they get your votes, well, they forget about you. They forget about you and, and they don't want anything to do with you. So I'm um, really curious to see what really happens right now. It's the same thing with, you know, you got a lot of people. You have people who genuinely, because obviously a lot of people in, in the creative industries and in, in Hollywood, et cetera, they have this whole you know hashtag on twitter read black writers um and you my thing is is that 
we should get more VCs to fund black creators, right? Because, you know, right. and I've, yeah. seen, I've seen a particular VC say that, oh, um, I've been a VC for over 25 years and I've never funded a black entrepreneur. And to me, that's shame on you because there are yeah. of black entrepreneurs that need funding, me in particular, you know, and I've actually had throughout my tenure, I've had a VC guy tell me he would never fund a black entrepreneur before I've had that happen. And it was very disheartening and it was very hurtful. And that right there is what creates the difference in economics, particularly in America between the black community and the white community, because we don't necessarily get the same opportunities. Yeah, but let me let me ask about this. Cause this is where I get frustrated with the venture capitalist system. It's, um, you have to depend on on these people with the money, uh, seeing through their biases and seeing through um, and and seeing you as a, a worthy individual when when you know for a fact that you already are. And, and aren't there alternative methods? Or, or couldn't we put a better system in place? Couldn't we uh, tax these people more and build a system of public funding, for example, so something like they have more in, in Canada, where Canada puts a lot of money into small indie studios, where where we could, as a people, try to build systemic systems that that actually prevent racism coming for, into it, it at all, which, of course, it still is. All systems are going to have uh, biases in them. Uh, but, I mean, is that something that you ever consider, or do you prefer the venture capitalist system? I'm, I don't prefer as it is right now, because it, it does create a lot of biases. And I think a lot of VCs, they may not even realize it, right? I think there should right. be a system, and I'm hoping, you know, you know, hopefully I grow to a point where I can influence some politicians where there should be a system in place where the VCs get sort of some write offs if they invest in, you know, black led, uh, black entrepreneurs, black led startups. There should be some specific write offs because obviously we know about slavery. We know about Jim Crow. Right. And there should be a, a reparation study. So if we're not going to get reparations, then, OK, start funding our startups. Mm -hmm. Start putting money into our community so we can take them back and we can build them because a lot of crimes um, are actually poverty related. A guy, you know, a guy probably won't think about robbing someone if he has enough money in his bank account and enough food. Right? Of course. And a lot of things were done by design and a lot of people are ignorant as to how these things were done by design. So, you know, and a lot of people don't realize also that there's a lot of responsibility when you're a black entrepreneur because you know, you're under a microscope already. <laughs> and right. And like, you don't just represent yourself. You represent everyone that you work with. And yeah, exactly. It, it's it's got to be a lot. It has to be a lot of pressure. Do you feel that? Um, But I thrive under pressure. I love it. I love it. I love when the lights come on. I, I shine the most. I shine the brightest. Right. Uh, I'm always going to take the game with a shot. Right. We're going to live and mm -hmm. we'll, we'll live and die by that. With being an entrepreneur, being a black entrepreneur specifically, there's going to be economical change, positive change that I hope to influence, but also a little bit of social change. But more or less, my focus is more in the economical aspect of it. Right. Because yeah. you can't have social change without economical change. You know, you can you can march and protest all you want. But if you're going to go home at night with, to, with a hungry stomach and not enough funds in your bank account, it's really going to affect you a lot more. Right. So that, that's that's I, I think that's why the defund the police is such a good slogan, because it does say this is about the money. This yeah, is about, about where this is about our priorities. Yeah, it's, it's about the money. It all comes back to that. We need we need economics. I think that we did enough. We did enough fighting for the social aspect of it. But, you know, economically, we need to fight for more black economics. And that's, you know, having this startup, I, I believe, is the first of many steps towards that process. Jeffrey Thompson Jr., thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Uh, why don't we uh, have you talk, if there's anything you want to uh, uh, pitch to people, if there's anything you want to plug, tell people where they can find you on the internet, go ahead and take that time to do that right now. You can find me on Twitter at jflash05. You can find me on Instagram at jflash05. The game we're developing is Pensions, which is a third-person stealth action game. Think if Hitman had a baby with Breaking Bad. It's that serious. Okay. <laughs> I will think about that a lot. That sounds dope as hell. <laughs> that is exactly, man, you just won me over with the, that. Okay. Hey, you, you nailed your elevator pitch, by the way. <laughs> you got that down. Um, okay. That's incredible. Uh, let me, let, one last thing before we get out of here. P do people spell your first name wrong a lot? Because I'm not Jeffrey too, but I'm R-E-Y. Do they usually give you the R-E-Y? Yes. Everyone spells my name wrong. It's E-R-Y. Yeah. Everyone yeah, spells R-E-Y. I'm sure they do. Yeah. Well, uh, 
Hey, hey, at least neither of us are G E O F F. So we got that going for us. <laughs> All right, man. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, and everybody listening, thank you so much for tuning in this week. I'll be back with another new episode next week. Until then, have a good one and goodbye. <laughs>